Okay, hi, thanks so much. It's really nice to be here to meet all of you. Congratulations on getting into Harvard and coming to Cambridge. Give yourself a hand, yeah. <laughs> Don't be so tentative. Um, I want to talk this afternoon about how Wonder Woman got into Harvard. She had a much harder time than all of you, as much as difficult as those admissions and SAT applications and SATs were. Wonder Woman had to climb over the Harvard gates. Here you can see from a cartoon from 1944. So I want to talk about the importance of studying history and the humanities and why it is that a liberal arts education begins with a sense of the, the way in which we exist on a timeline, that all of the inquiry that we make into the world in which we live in some ways actually does begin with a question about the past. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of Wonder Woman, which is an odd thing for me to talk about. I'm an American political historian. I'm not a comic books fan. Uh, I, but I do want to, I want to tell you, I want to argue today that comic books, like everything else, has a history that can explain to us the world in which we live. This very building has a history that is incredibly illuminating, and not least of, not least the way in which it intersects with the history of Wonder Woman. So comic books started in the 1930s. The first superhero comic is um, Superman, which starts in 1938. Batman follows in 1939. And Wonder Woman debuts in 1941. Here she is in 1942. Wonder Woman was a publicity stunt by the company that became DC Comics. Because in the 1930s, Superman and Batman were subject to an enormous amount of criticism. Comic books were a new art form. Parents were really worried about their kids reading them. They seemed incredibly violent. In particular, their violence was very masculine. And also, Superman looked to a lot of Americans like a fascist. He comes from a master race. He's an ubermensch. He's a superman. Um, so parents gathered in towns, uh, in town commons, and burned comic books. Uh, comic books were banned from schools. Batman carried a gun at a time when Americans were very upset about the private possession of uh, firearms. So Wonder Woman was a publicity stunt by DC Comics aimed to quiet the critics of comic books, who said that comic books were too violent and too masculine in particular. She's the most iconic female superhero. Only uh, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman have been continuously in print since this era, which is known as the golden age of comics. Her creator was kept a secret. It was a trade secret who, who created Wonder Woman until she got her own comic book magazine, Wonder Woman Comics, in 1942, when what was released here was uh, the name of the creator of, Super, of, of Wonder Woman. He's this heavyset guy in the lower left with a, with a jacket on uh, in this page from Wonder Woman Comics from 1942 called The Men Behind Wonder Woman. And it was revealed that the creator of Wonder Woman was world-famous consulting psychologist William Moulton Marston. Morrison had three degrees from Harvard. He had been an undergraduate here. He graduated in 1915. Then he went to Harvard Law School, graduated in 1918, served in the First World War briefly, and then finished a PhD in psychology here at Harvard in 1921. He was an extremely well-known psychologist. And it was Morrison who said to DC Comics when he was hired as a consultant, you know what you need to do? If you want to have Americans stop burning comic books and libraries stop banning them, you need to have a female superhero. Because the future of the United States and of the world is the future of the empowerment of women. So in the press release, this huge press campaign that was launched to promote Wonder Woman in 1942, the claim that Wonder Woman was explicitly a feminist project was made again and again and again. So here, uh, Wonder Woman was conceived by Dr. Marston to set up a standard among children and young people of strong, free, courageous womanhood, and to combat the idea that women are inferior to men, and to inspire girls to self-confidence and achievement in athletics, occupations, and professions monopolized by men, because the only hope for civilization is the greater freedom, development, and equality of women in all fields of human activity. This is where you applaud! Yay! Historian, I came, I came across this press release in DC Comics archives. It took me years to get into DC Comics archives. Let me tell you, it was worth the wait. Um, this press release is incredible. In 1942, people who are publishing Wonder Woman are, are just, it's a feminist manifesto, and it's so interesting. Why? Why would that happen? And you might think, you know, I ask my students this, and people say, well, it's trying to get women to work in the Second World War. It's the Rosie the Riveter era. Men are off fighting the Second World War. Women are supposed to go into the paid labor force. And, and make munitions, that must be what this is all about. Well, in, in a way, that's true. That's a really good first thought. But the second thought is really where the true history lies. Wonder Woman, the comics themselves, are actually full of quite overt feminism. The Wonder Woman comes to the United States from the land of the Amazons in order to fight for the equal rights of women. 
That is her whole mandate, her reason for being. She does things like run for president. Now, the careful viewer will note this is a thousand years in the future. So um, I think you know supporters of Hillary Clinton should be proud that we didn't have to wait a thousand years for at least the campaign stage to be erected. Um, but there's something really interesting about the quite overt feminism of the character. And even privately, Marston, when he was asked, why did you create Wonder Woman? Not just in a press release, but he would say things like this. Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for the new type of woman who should, I believe, rule the world. So what's going on here in, 19, in the 1940s? Well, there's something quite mysterious, in fact, about Wonder Woman. Superman and Batman, we, you kind of immediately know where they come from. Superman comes from science fiction, pulp science fiction, which was a huge, public, uh, a huge popular literature beginning in the 1920s. Um, Batman comes from uh, detective fiction. Batman is basically just Dick Tracy in a ridiculous outfit. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a huge interest, reader interest in detective fiction in that era. But where does Wonder Woman come? Where does Wonder Woman come from? She seems to kind of come out of nowhere. And for a long time, for people who study comic books, she's been really quite mysterious. It's not just that she has a secret identity. She puts on glasses and pretends she's a secretary. Um, but she actually really has quite a mysterious history. So I got to be really interested in, in Marston, the guy that created Wonder Woman. And this is for the parents in the room. This is Marston when he was a young, <laughs> he's a one-year-old. And here he is as a Harvard freshman. Um, he became quite a handsome, but this is, this, is the, this is the journey that your children have traveled in the last 18 years. I love this photograph of him. Uh, this is his Harvard, his senior uh, high school photograph, which is also his Harvard freshman photograph. So Marston gets to Harvard in 1911, and his world is upended by his time here. Because Harvard at the time had only fairly recently been walled in and gated in. And one of the reasons for that, really frankly, was the establishment of Radcliffe College in the 1890s. Radcliffe was then the Women's College of Harvard. And uh, women at Radcliffe took all their classes with Harvard faculty, but they were really not allowed in the yard. The yard was the bastion of men. Now, Marston, when he came, his faculty advisor, a philosopher named George Herbert Palmer, was married to the president of Wellesley College, a suffragist named Alice Freeman Palmer. And Mar Marston's faculty advisor was the, the uh, sponsor for the Harvard Men's League for Women's Suffrage, a pro-suffrage men's organization on campus. And the, the, the Harvard Men's League for Women's Suffrage, in the fall of Marston's freshman year, invited the British suffragist Emmeline Pankhurst to speak in Sanders Hall. And she agreed to come. She was doing a US tour. Now, Sanders, uh, Pankhurst was famous for bringing militancy. She's like the Martin Luther King of the suffrage movement. She, um, sorry, the slides keep advancing. She, she famously did things like chain herself to the gates outside 10 Downing Street in order to protest women's lack of the right to vote. So she brought militant tactics to the suffrage movement, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. At the time that the Harvard Men's League invited her to speak here in Saunders Hall, women were not allowed to speak at Harvard. And the Harvard Corporation held a special meeting to discuss whether or not to let Emmeline Pankhurst enter this room and decided not. She was banned from speaking in any building owned by Harvard, which inspired a protest across the country. The Detroit Free Press famously had a, uh, a headline of one of their stories called, Is Harvard Afraid of Mrs. Pankhurst? And the answer is, you bet. Harvard was terrified of Mrs. Pankhurst. So she spoke and said at a dance hall in Harvard Yard, uh, I mean, in, in Harvard Square. And Marston went. So in other words, Marston, as a freshman here at Harvard, had a front row seat to the really important and very exciting militant suffragism that gained American women the right to vote by 1920. So when you look at his comics in Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman comics from the 1940s, and Wonder Woman is always doing things like trying to leap over the walls uh, to get into a campus, or disguising herself with a varsity sweater with an H on it to sneak into a lecture hall like this one. One of the things that really comes, comes across when you think about Wonder Woman in relationship to Marston's own life is that the story of Wonder Woman is really Marston's witnessing of the early suffrage movement. He was also um, very much influenced by his wife here, Elizabeth Holloway, who went to Mount Holyoke College where she played field hockey. Are there any field hockey players? No? I played field hockey, so I'm always looking for field. She played field hockey. She's the staff of the Mount Holyoke magazine. But Mount Holyoke, which is a women's college, was a hotbed of suffragism. They had women's rights marches. They had suffrage parades. They had mock elections. The, the, the collegiate leader of the suffrage movement was Mount Holyoke, the place that Marston, when he would get on the train in Boston and go to visit his girlfriend at Mount Holyoke, spent most of his time when he wasn't in Cambridge. 
Marston is actually most famous not for creating Wonder Woman, but for his undergraduate thesis at Harvard, which he started in his junior year. Here he is with the glasses. William Moulton Marston invented the lie detector as a junior at Harvard when he was doing experiments in Harvard's psycho psychological laboratory. Experimental psychology was new at the time. Harvard had the first experimental la psychology laboratory. And Marston's advisor, Hugo Munsterberg, was a famous anti-suffragist. He did not believe women should have the right to vote. And he liked to do things like tie women up to machines in his laboratory in Emerson Hall. So Wonder Woman's arch nemesis, it turns out, is an evil psychologist named Dr. Psycho, who is always <laughs> locking her up in the basement of his psychological laboratory. In other words, most of what happens in Wonder Woman happened here at Harvard first, and was Marston's observation of the way that men, in particular male scientists and social scientists, treated women students. Marston, interestingly enough, didn't have any money to go to Harvard. He paid his way himself through Harvard by writing screenplays for the silent movie industry. Here's one of his films about how it's autobiographical. It's about how he didn't make the football team his freshman year. Uh, this is a silent film that he wrote that was produced, directed by D.W. Griffith, the guy who made Birth of a Nation, about uh, a young man whose fiance discovers that he is keeping a maid in the closet, which also turns out to be autobiographical in Marston's case. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Marston married his college sweetheart, Elizabeth Holloway, the great suffragist from Mount Holyoke. She wanted to go to law school. Harvard didn't admit women to law school. She went to BU for law school. She wanted to get a PhD. Harvard did not admit women for a PhD. She went to Radcliffe and got a master's degree. And as the family tells it, she wrote her husband's PhD thesis. Marston went on to teach at Tufts, which is not too far from here, and is also uh, my alma mater. And here he is 10 years later. Now he's 32. And here's his wife, EHM, Elizabeth Holloway Marston, at Tufts commencement in 1926, with a student who's graduating, Olive Byrne, who'd majored in psychology, and Olive Byrne's mother here. So this is the classic, you know, four years from now, you'll take this photograph, but please, dear God, don't let it be this photograph. Because the reason for this photograph is that Marston, among his many theories as a psychologist, he believed that, women, that men needed more than one sexual partner. And so he, um, he and his wife, he convinced his wife that they should bring young Olive Byrne, his undergraduate, um, into their house as their mistress and that they would raise a family together. And they uh, lived as a threesome for the rest of their lives. They raised four children together. This is important because this was a family secret. It was obviously an extremely scandalous family arrangement for someone who's known to give psychological advice. Um, <laughs> And it's also really important politically. It's the political history here that's of interest to me. Mother here, Olive Byrne's mother, Ethel Byrne, with her sister Margaret Sanger, founded the first feminist magazine in 1914 called The Woman Rebel, in which they coined the phrase birth control. You may have heard of Margaret Sanger, Olive Byrne's aunt, because she and Ethel Byrne founded Planned Parenthood in 1916 when they opened the first birth control clinic in the United States for which they were both arrested within days and went to trial. They're here, this is Margaret Sanger on the left and Olive Byrne's mother, Ethel Byrne, on the right. Ethel Byrne uh, was sent to prison for 30 days and went on a hunger strike in imitation of Emmeline Pankhurst. She nearly died and her, she was pardoned because Margaret Sanger promised that she would never, her sister would never again be involved in the birth control movement. That's the only reason why Ethel Byrne is completely unknown and Margaret Sanger is one of the best known feminists of the 20th century, a deeply controversial person, but nevertheless important for me in trying to ex understand and research the history of this sort of well, uh, poorly understood comic book character, because Margaret Sanger was a member of the family that created Wonder Woman. Sanger went on after opening birth control clinics to founding this magazine, The Birth Control Review, in 1923, and like suffrage cartoonists, feminist cartoonists, and birth control activists used this conceit that, of women being chained and uh, because the idea was that women were enslaved to men. So when um, Emmeline Pankhurst chained herself to the gates outside 10 Downing Street, it was a way to communicate uh, that women were, were in chains because they didn't have the right to vote. Um, that uh, balls and chains make their appearance in Wonder Woman all over the place. They're very concerning and disturbing to look at iconographically, um, but they're an important part of uh, the way in which the character is tied to the history of the suffrage movement. I just will see if I can show you this. Maybe that's not going to work. There's a, um, I was going to show you a slide of Marston talking. but So anyway, Marston, after he created um, the lie detector, he taught at Tufts, established this unusual family arrangement. 
was teaching at Columbia for a while when it was discovered that he and his wife shared a mistress with whom they were raising their children. He was blacklisted from academic life, never again had another academic job, and so he went to Hollywood as an advisor to Universal and Paramount Studios. A lot of the films you've seen from the 1930s are films that Marston worked on. He was really interested in using his lie detector to determine what got audiences excited and what was too exciting for them to watch. So by 1940, when DC Comics is looking for someone to help them out with this new visual medium, the comic book, and a controversial audience reaction, the natural person for them to hire is William Moulton Marston, world-renowned consulting psychologist, whose family arrangements are completely hidden and secret, and his ties to Margaret Sanger, to the birth control movement, are entirely unknown, and remained unknown until just a couple of years ago when I wrote this book. So Marston says, oh, I have this great idea. It's all mine. It's my idea. We should create a female superhero. And then um, creates this superhero who is chained up like Emmeline Pankhurst, whose stories come from the suffrage movement, from the birth control movement, from the early feminist movement, and a lot from the efforts of women at Harvard to gain equality with men here. And the iconography of Wonder Woman draws quite explicitly from the suffrage cartoons of people like Lou Rogers, who before she worked for Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Review, was a suffragist cartoon for a regular pro-suffrage page on a regular mag weekly magazine called Judge, where she did things like represent women in just the same fashion that Marston's artist Harry G. Peter did here, iconographically representing women, breaking her chains, uh, breaking the tyranny that men hold over her. Harry G. Peter, the guy that Marston hired to write, to draw Wonder Woman, actually was a suffrage cartoonist with Lou Rogers. They were staff artists on the same magazine in the 19-teens. So Wonder Woman has this incredibly important history that had been utterly unknown, because by the 1940s, everybody forgot what suffrage cartoons looked like. And Wonder Woman looked like she was just engaged in, in, in some very sort of kinky bondage. But really, Wonder Woman's roots are in the suffrage iconography and the very particular political protests that suffragists and feminists and birth control activists waged in the 1910s. The real story, the secret of Wonder Woman isn't the men behind Wonder Woman, it's the many women behind Wonder Woman. This is really important in the world in which we live right now in the you know, mo mo movie theater near you. There's a Superman versus Batman movie showing that has this actress Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman represented in a very different way than the character is when she was represented as a suffragette. But I take a great deal of pleasure in a campaign run by a couple of undergraduate women a few years ago when they were running for the undergraduate council that they ran as Wonder Woman trying to break into the gates of, the <laughs> of Harvard Yard, dressed as Wonder Woman running, uh, running to be representatives on the student body. So <laughs> congratulations once again, and I hope that your entrance to Harvard is not so chaotic as this. Thanks.